Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers. This is a really important conference. I'm sorry we're not there in person, perhaps next year, but I'm very glad we're able to meet this way. It's amazing for information sharing, and it's also really great for those of us who are a bit isolated at the edge of the known universe. Um, so where my lab works, we do work in the One Health, with the One Health very much in mind. And the aspect of One Health that ties together all of the lobes is one of the many aspects is vector biology. Not surprisingly, we're going to be talking about ticks as the vectors, there are obviously many more. While we're breaking this down into three separate research talks that I'll be sharing with uh, some of my students, there are two reoccurring themes. Basically, it boils down to species matter. So we're going to be talking about the fact that there are many different reservoir species. It's far more complicated than mice, tick, human. And there are also many Borrelia species. And I'm going to leave you with the thought that perhaps we have been too narrow in our lab studies focusing just on Borrelia burgdorferi. And we need to open up and see what's in nature to really understand what people, what animals may be suffering from. The way the talks will work is I'm going to start to uh, with the human aspect of it. This is work done uh, by one of my former master's students and a veterinarian, uh, Hazibul Haq. He's now doing his PhD. Uh, his work, along with Samantha Bishop, uh, has been on with human tissue that has been donated. And we're looking at the effect of, well, we're looking at Borrelia in the heart to see if there is a correlation between Borrelia present and heart uh, disease. Followed by that, uh, Samantha will be continuing to talk about Borrelia burgdorferi, but also looking at Borrelia bisseti and Leptospira in wildlife. The wildlife theme will be continued by Christopher Zink, who's completed uh, his master's in my lab and is now working on his PhD in the Verdure lab at Saskatoon. Christopher will be talking about reservoir species as well as tissue trophisms for the diff different Borrelia and implications for congenital transmission. Then we'll come back to me briefly for the implications. So to dive into it, one note before we go is, as has already been noted, all tools have strengths and weaknesses and we have to acknowledge what they are because that way we can interpret the data. I'll be talking about molecular tools and one strength of molecular tools is that it allows us to detect the pathogens directly. So we're not relying on indirect detection such as serology. It can, the other advantage, particularly of the DNA tools, I'll admit to being a geneticist at this point. So I see all organisms as a way of moving DNA around, but as long as you have DNA, you can use these tools. So it can be used in humans, wildlife, companion animals, agricultural animals. It's very versatile. And the final advantage is that if you have DNA, you can sequence it, which allows us very good information about what type of Borrelia we're actually talking about. So to dive into the first component of this talk, which is the human studies, I'm going to be talking about the correlation between Borrelia in the heart and heart function, cardiac involvement. So that as not, not a surprise to anyone here, if not treated early enough in infection to eliminate infection, the spirochetes, the Borrelia spirochetes will replicate and they will disseminate in the body. They disseminate pretty much anywhere, and there's no reason to think the heart is, is going to be immune. The heart is no exception, so Borrelia can establish there. The cardiac implications of Borrelia infection has been looked at and is acknowledged a little bit in the acute phase. Um, it, there's a correlation with atrioventricular block and pericarditis. In the chronic phase, there is much less information. There are a few uh, case studies. A lot of the problem in investigating the role of Borrelia in the chronic phase on cardiac function is that chronic Lyme disease is not necessarily accepted as a thing. So how can it have an effect? So this is an area that requires more investigation. 
this was one of the aims of this study was to ask the very simple question, is there a correlation between the presence of Borrelia in cardiac tissue in human individuals who have had Lyme disease or have Lyme disease and who have cardiac dysfunction? Our methods are the methods we use for pretty much anything. Uh, from, for a geneticist, uh, tissue is tissue. So we will take uh, tissue from human and animal specimens, living and dead. Um, those organs are harvested by uh, the appropriate pathologists and sent to the lab. We can get received tissues either in ethanol, which can be used to extract DNA. So we amplify it by PCR and send it and get it sequenced or we receive tissues as formal and fixed tissues, which is good for fluorescent in situ hybridization, also known as FISH, or immunohistology. The two donors who in fact started this study by approaching us and saying, look, um, can we contribute to your research? This was in fact donor one. So both of our donors, donor one and donor two, very creatively named, are or were residents of areas of Canada that are considered endemic for ticks and Lyme disease. Donor one had both recreational and residential exposure to ticks, family members with Lyme disease, and Lyme-like symptoms that were reported um, in her uh, early 60s. Although her Canadian serology was negative and her US Western blot was equivocal, because of the symptoms, uh, her physician provided a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease. And that uh, was followed up with aggressive long-term antibiotic treatment. The result, result of that treatment was a return to complete health. The only flaw in, in this individual's health was that aortic valve replacement re, was, requi was required nine years after the first illness uh, due to a calcified aortic valve. From that, we received uh, biopsy tissues. And I'd also like to note, this is the only study where we've had the enthusiastic participation of three different physicians, which was a nice change. Donor two, the story is somewhat more depressing. Uh, we're talking about an individual who was a resident of a highly endemic area. The individual exhibited Lyme-like symptoms and rashes at the age of, at a young age. Lyme disease was not considered at the time. The immediate symptoms, the most pressing symptoms were cardiac symptoms. The individual was hospitalized, discharged upon stabilization. But over the next 10 years, the individual had increasingly difficult health situation with migratory arthritis, particularly involving the knee joint, uh, rashes, fatigue, neurological symptoms. The family did eventually push for Lyme disease testing. Canadian serology was negative. The Western blot was positive. However, because the Canadian serology was negative, there was no Lyme disease treatment. Uh, donor two died in two years ago at the age of 17 from heart failure. This study was initiated by her family. Okay, for methods I've already mentioned, we're looking at samples, both in DNA and formaldehyde fixed. For donor one, we had both. For donor two, we only had the standard paraffin blocks from autopsy. I'm gonna go through the results, um, basically technique by technique. So for donor one, for the nested PCR results, I'm not going to delve in how nested PCR works. It suffice to say that it's a sensitive and specific technique for amplifying low abundance DNA. We received two, three tissues from donor one. Of those three tissues, only one, uh, the connective tissue chunk of the left internal thoracic artery was, uh, was able to generate an amplicon for Borrelia. The other two tissues showed no we were unable to demonstrate any amplification of Borrelia from those tissues. Uh, 
we sequ sequenced the amplicon and it showed song, strong sequence identity to Borrelia burgdorferi. The picture on the top right uh, demonstrates amplicons on a gel, sort of the standard molecular stuff. Moving on to fluorescent in situ hybridization, we were able to do this for both donors. This is a process where you fluorescently label one strand of DNA that is complementary to your target strand of DNA, which in this case was Borrelia DNA. Top right shows what happens if you have a negative control. There's basically just a uniform green colored background. Where there is a positive target, you see little dots of yellow, which are highlighted by red arrows, which will work great for everyone who isn't red, green, colorblind. My apologies. For the two donors, for donor one, we did see target in only the left thoracic artery. We did not see any signal in the other two tissues that uh, could be distinguished from backgrounds. Basically, there was nothing. In the left thoracic artery, we saw a few round bodies, but mostly we saw these long stringy structures. They're far too big to be a standard spirochete. They're weird and deformed looking, and I don't have a good explanation for what they are. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. For donor two, it was a different story. That, uh, that's the lower panel, and what you see are a lot of yellow specks. I've actually not seen a sample with that much signal. The pericardium was just rife with Borrelia, which is depressing. Uh, the same, st the structures were both punctate and typical spiroketal forms, and we could distinguish them from all the other stuff that glows. We're still in the process of testing these tissues. The final technique we looked at was immunohistology. This is a technique that is probably familiar to many people. You use an antibody that is targeted to a protein of interest. In this case, it's a polyclonal that picks up external proteins of Borrelia burgdorferi in its spiroketal dividing form. That antibody is tagged either fluorescently or with an enzyme that generates a colored dye. On the right, you have unstained, uh, you have uninfected uh, control tissue where the negative control shows nothing. And the, the image on the left shows a positive control. The stain is, the positive signal is either pink or brown depending on exposure. For donor one, this is the only individual for which we've done this. Again, we have the same story. We do pick up signal in the thoracic artery and the connective tissue there. That's the brown stuff highlighted by the red arrows. The other tissues, yes, you see speckly stuff and purple stuff, but that's just stain that hasn't been washed off. So same story. Um, we see some structures, they don't look particularly viable. They don't look normal spirochetes and we see them only in the connective tissue. So to conclude, the, for donor one, we were able to detect Borrelia by three different techniques, but only in the biopsied thoracic artery tissue, not the other tissues. The Borrelia DNA was not, certainly not abundant, and it was only present in connective tissue. Now, these results do validate the clinical diagnosis that was provided to the donor. But the question, of course, remains, why is Borrelia there after seven years of aggressive treatment? The good news from the individual's point of view is that they are well, they are active, and they are healthy, and uh, the individual is still actively hiking in tick-infested forests. Good for her. Uh, donor two, we saw a lot of Borrelia. We're still continuing the testing of this. These results are certainly consistent with the Western blot serology, but not the Canadian serology. Um, for both individuals, this the important question is what this is reporting is a correlation. Yes, we see Borrelia. Yes, we see cardiac malfunction. 
but what is the connection? And working that out is going to rely on animal studies where we can do interventional studies, but also the involvement of people who know a lot more about hearts than I do. To focus on the significance of these studies, other than validating the fact that molecular tools have their place, these studies allow, give us a new set of tools that we can start to use to address important research questions, such as where is Borrelia in the tissue, what are the tissue trophisms, in what organisms do we find it, and eventually what uh, is there a causal linkage between the presence of Borrelia and damage to those tissues. The next two talks are going to continue this theme by looking at where we find Borrelia in which organisms and followed by where in which organisms. So I'm going to hand over now to Samantha Bishop.